Everybody loves a good return in wrestling. After all, from a fan's perspective, they get to miss someone for a while, allowing their interest to build back up again until the moment where the big comeback pop happens. And from the point of view of a wrestler, they get to take a break and return with a fresh coat of paint, feeling revitalized and new all over again in the process. At least, that's the way it's supposed to happen because, despite there being plenty of cases of great returns over the years, there have been just as many which didn't quite work out so well. But which returns were the worst of all? Well, join us today as we take a deep dive into some of the biggest blunders of them all in Failed Returns, WWE's Worst Comebacks. And of course, if we're going to start anywhere, we really should start with what was one of the most anticipated returns of all time, one that, up until it happened, fans thought they would never see, and that was Bret Hart's in 2006. Yes, this was the year that hell officially froze over, with the lingering tensions over the Montreal Screwjob having died away enough that the hitman could be enticed back by the promise of creative control over a career retrospective DVD. The former WWF champion would make his re-debut with the company in April of that year when he was inducted into their Hall of Fame. After that, he'd even get to take part in a very emotional segment on an episode of Raw when he and Shawn Michaels finally buried the hatchet after all those years. And had it been left there, it might have been a nice moment. Unfortunately for everyone involved, however, despite spending the decade or so prior to this insisting he would never turn Montreal into an angle, Hart would go back on this when Vince McMahon convinced him to have a match between the two at WrestleMania 26. That said, by now there were such limitations on what the hitman could do in the ring that this was always going to be a disaster. Fans just weren't prepared for how bad of a disaster it would be though, as when the time for the bout came, it would pretty much stink out the joint by having Brett finally get a hold of the boss after an over-convoluted storyline had taken place, only to beat him up so slowly and so badly that some fans in the audience started gaining sympathy for the heel. Still, while this one didn't work out, Brett would at least get to redeem himself somewhat when, over the next few years, he'd continue to make sporadic appearances on WWE TV, at one point even winning the United States title from The Miz. Redemption, though, is something our next subject would not get to have because it seemed like the heavens weren't shining down on him when Shawn Michaels made his return to the ring in 2018. Yes, while the hitman got to take something good out of his return, his most hated rival would not get the same honor, as after having arguably the most perfect retirement in wrestling history at WrestleMania 26, it was an immediate cause for concern when he announced he would be returning for one more match at the Saudi Arabian show Crown Jewel in November of that year. After all, prior to this, he'd had two separate Hall of Fame runs, first in the mid-90s and then again in the 2000s. And after that second run had finished, HBK seemed all too happy to leave his legacy be then, with him repeatedly refusing offers to come back to the ring in the years following. That was until he was given an offer he couldn't refuse and was finally convinced to lace up his boots one more time for the 2018 Crown Jewel pay-per-view as part of a tag team match with Triple H as they took on The Undertaker and Kane. And while fans were hesitant upon hearing this news, it was still Shawn Michaels they were talking about here, so surely if anyone could pull it off, even at his age, it would be him. Well, as it turned out, he couldn't, because after HBK would finally hit the ring on November 2nd, it would turn out to be one of the worst matches in recent memory. Yes, if something could have gone wrong that night, then it did go wrong. From Kane's mask falling off to Triple H getting injured, the match left such a stink in fans' minds afterwards that many have chosen to retroactively forget it ever happened. Of course, Sean doesn't have the luxury of doing this, however, as in the years since, he's gone on to say that he regretted making his return that night and that it was something he would never do again, no matter how much money was thrown his way. But when it comes to his old tag team partner, though, you could probably offer him $20 and a six-pack of beer and he'd be happy to show up at your event. Because for Marty Jannetty, a bit of extra cash to party with is always awesome. Ah yes, Party Marty, the man who, despite being a very good wrestler, has seen his career turn into little more than a punchline over the years, with his personal issues constantly hobbling any opportunities he was given, there was really little anyone else could do for him. Not that people didn't try, of course. WWE included because, even though he'd already been fired numerous times in the years prior, the company would choose to bring him back again in 2005 when he got to take on Kurt Angle as part of the build-up to the Olympic Heroes WrestleMania 21 encounter with Shawn Michaels. 
And despite putting on a very impressive performance during this one, all of that goodwill would once again be undone when, a year later, Marty came back again, this time to team up with his old tag partner as the Rockers reunited to fight the Spirit Squad. And sure, this one might have been a nice nostalgia spot if kept to being a one-time thing, but rather than doing this, Vince McMahon kept Jannetty around for a while after, giving him repeated opportunities to earn another contract should he humiliate himself by doing things such as joining the boss's Kiss My Ass Club. Of course, that led to fans quickly tiring of the whole thing because with the Rockers' time having long since passed, there was really no desire to see Marty in a WWE ring anymore. That then was why he would eventually be cut from the roster once more, with him never getting another shot to have a full-time run in WWE as of the time of this video's recording. Maybe he should have taken some tips from Jim Helwig then because no matter what he did to anger Vince McMahon over the years, he would seemingly always get invited back. Why was this? We're not sure exactly. Of course, The Warrior was a big star for the company during his initial run in the late 80s and early 90s, but with him failing to get over enough to succeed Hulk Hogan as the face of the company after WrestleMania 6, that initial fire would start to die away. And it certainly didn't help things when he would repeatedly be fired during this period, first after allegedly holding up the boss for money prior to going out to the ring at SummerSlam the following year, and then again after being caught using anabolic steroids in 1992. That said, given what we know about Jim Helwig the man, it's perhaps no surprise that he was so difficult to deal with behind the scenes. Still, McMahon obviously saw enough in him that, in 1996, he would bring him back into the fold for a third time. Now, it should be said that this was right as WWF was in one of its darkest periods financially, and WCW was just starting to heat up with the NWO angle. So maybe that's why the boss was so desperate to get some star power on his roster then. Pretty predictably, though, soon after the Warrior made his return at WrestleMania 12, squashing Hunter Hearst Helmsley in under two minutes, it would become clear that fan interest for him had died down, with many of the children who had once idolized him and now having moved on to other figures such as Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels. And to make matters worse, the whole thing was even further watered down by the fact that WWF had agreed to help Helwig promote his comic book as part of the terms of his comeback with this leading to numerous segments which felt like they had no place on Raw. On top of that, the Warriors' attitude problems were just as bad as ever, with him no-showing a number of live events just a few months after his return, something which led to Vince McMahon publicly suspending him until further notice. From Helwig's perspective, however, he'd argued that the only reason he missed those shows was because his dad had just died. That said, his prior history and his apparent estrangement from his father being well known, many were left skeptical about this, and this was why, by July of that year, he'd be gone altogether, never to return until 2014. Yes, as it turned out, trying to restart the magic of the Ultimate Warrior in 1996 was a bit of a failure all around, but then this was a character which was always designed for a specific time and place. When it came to our next subject, however, given his evergreen skills on the mic, there is really no reason it shouldn't have worked out later in his life. That's why it was so disappointing when Rowdy Roddy Piper returned in 2005 and failed to make much of an impact at all. But how did Hot Rod end up finding himself back in WWE at such a late stage in his career? Well, it all started when, after hosting an episode of Piper's Pit at WrestleMania 21, he'd find himself in the crosshairs of Randy Orton, someone who was then going through his legend killer phase. So, looking for another legend to snuff out then, Orton would bring his father along, the very man who had been in Piper's corner at WrestleMania 1, to challenge Hot Rod to a handicap match later that year. Unfortunately, though, despite winning this one, the Canadian's night would end with him being given a severe beatdown by Randy, something which only went further towards solidifying the youngster's legend killer status and caused Roddy to be out of action for the next year. That said, when he did return, he would reach a temporary high when, while teaming up with Ric Flair on the November 6, 2006 episode of Raw, he'd defeat the Spirit Squad to become a World Tag Team Champion. Of course, while this might have been a nice nostalgia moment for the fans in attendance, the sight of two out-of-shape older men defeating young up-and-comers did little to help anyone or make the belts feel more important in the long run. And as it happened, this would also mark the beginning of the end for Piper because, after losing the tag team titles to Randy Orton and Edge soon after this, he would mill around for a while longer, entering the 2007 Royal Rumble match and attacking his old foe Jimmy Snuka, all before then being part of a 3-on-1 handicap match at WrestleMania 25 when he, Snuka, and Ricky Steamboat took on Chris Jericho in a losing effort. 
But even if this run didn't live up to the high standards he'd been able to achieve in the 80s, at the very least, Roddy didn't do anything to tarnish his legacy during it. This, however, is not something we can say about our next entry, because when Animal returned around the same time in 2005, it became very clear very quickly that he should have stayed in retirement. And a big part of the reason for this was the ying to his yang, Hawk had passed away by then, so the idea of having one road warrior without the other felt unnecessary. That said, it didn't stop Animal from feeling like he could wring a little more life from the gimmick yet as, upon returning to WWE TV in July of that year, he'd find a new partner in the form of Heidenreich, someone who may have had the physical look of a road warrior, but certainly didn't have the charisma to match. And that was why, despite Animal and Heidenreich defeating Eminem to become the WWE Tag Team Champions at the July 24th Great American Bash pay-per-view, the whole thing would end up failing from there, as with fans not wanting to see anyone replace Hawk in the role, things would quickly fizzle out. So changing gears then, Animal would continue to keep a role for himself on the show when he turned heel on Matt Hardy, starting a feud with him there as he went on a brief run as a singles wrestler. Again, though, no one really wanted to see one road warrior as part of what had made their act so special was that the two of them made a complete package. And this then was ultimately why, after milling around the mid-card for a while, taking on the likes of Chris Benoit and Paul Burchill, Animal would be released from his contract altogether, with him not returning to the company again until 2011, at which point both he and Hawk were put where they belonged as part of the WWE Hall of Fame. Yes, sometimes if you take one part from a whole, it causes the entire thing to stop working. It's been the case for many great tag teams in the past, and it likely will continue to be the case for many other great tag teams in the future. Of course, that doesn't explain why someone who had primarily been a singles performer would fail to have a meaningful comeback around the same time as Animal was teaming with Heidenreich, because it was while this was happening that Tatanka would also come and go in short order. Well, maybe there is an explanation for this after all, as even during his initial run in the early to mid-90s, Chris Chavez hadn't exactly lit the world on fire. Sure, he'd been a popular enough mid-card act, but when it came to anything higher than this, he just never seemed like the guy to make it happen. So when he returned to WWE in 2006 then, expectations were already muted as, with him now being a decade older and many of his fans having forgotten about him already, it never really felt like this one was going to come to much. That said, even with those limited hopes for what a Tatanka run in the mid-2000s could be, things were still somewhat disappointing because upon making a surprise appearance on the August 1st episode of Raw to take on Eugene, he'd end up losing via disqualification come the end of the match. Yes, it was an inauspicious return for the new generation era star, and it would begin a continuing pattern which saw him never really do much of note from there. In fact, despite working on the house show circuit for the remainder of 2005, he wouldn't actually reappear on TV until January of 2006 during the Royal Rumble match, at which point he was eliminated in short order by Johnny Nitro and Joey Mercury. That said, at least this would give him something of a feud as, after recruiting Matt Hardy to be his tag partner following this, Tatanka would set his sights on taking Eminem's tag team titles away from them as revenge for what they'd done to him at the Rumble. Unfortunately though, he wouldn't be able to do this either, and so after that quest fizzled out into nothing, he'd return to singles action for a while, there starting a lengthy losing streak which mirrored his winning one when he first joined WWF in the 90s. Then, in 2007, finally deciding it was time to put him out of his misery, WWE would release him from his contract entirely, sending him back out to the Indies where he would spend the remainder of his career. So as expected, the whole thing had turned out to be a disappointment. One thing we will say for Tatanka's mid-2000s run, however, is that at least he got to step in the ring, the same of which can't be said for Shelton Benjamin when he returned to WWE in 2016. But wait, we hear you say. Shelton Benjamin did return to WWE in the late 2010s and is still a part of the roster to this day. In fact, he's notably been an on and off again member of the Hurt Business during this period. Well, yes, that's true. But after leaving the company following his first run in the early 2000s, his initial attempts at making a return would be stalled. And that's because after a graphic was shown on the July 26, 2016 episode of SmackDown stating that the gold standard would finally, after all those years, be coming back to the company which had initially made him famous, he'd immediately tear his rotator cuff while training. But what made this even worse for him was that he hadn't officially been signed to a new contract yet, and that was why, feeling like they should let him heal up before doing so, WWE would decide to call the whole thing off for a while, 
Luckily then, by the time he'd healed up a year later, Vince McMahon was still interested and would formally sign him up at this point, where, as we've mentioned earlier, Benjamin would go on to have a solid run as part of one of the better stables WWE has done in years. Of course, not everyone gets to recover after a shaky start to a return. No, in fact, for some people, it starts out bad and only gets worse from there. And it doesn't even matter if you're a former champion either as it happens, because despite holding the Intercontinental, European, and Tag Team titles at various points during his prior run, the British Bulldogs' comeback in 1999 would be one which ultimately failed. But then perhaps it was never destined to work out at this time as, no longer the athletic big man he had been some years prior, Davy Boy Smith had become so bloated at this point that he often looked like he was having trouble lowering his arms all the way. Still, it didn't stop WWF from trying to capitalize on his past successes by throwing him right into the main event scene upon coming back in September of that year, with him almost immediately entering into the world title picture and even getting into a feud with The Rock. Unfortunately for the Englishman, however, this feud would become most remembered for him getting rock-bottomed into dog poop, the dog poop, the dog poop, during a match with the Great One on an episode of SmackDown soon after. Then, following this, he'd be sent packing down to the mid-card, where he'd spend the rest of his run battling it out for lower card belts like the European Championship and the Hardcore Championship. And he wasn't the only legend of the past who started off strong and then quickly faltered upon his return to WWE, because for a brief moment in 2002, it looked like Mr. Perfect was about to pick up right where he left off. How did he do this? Well, by entering that January's Royal Rumble and lasting all the way to the Final Four, with this seeming to show fans that the Hogan-era star was back and back in a big way. Sure, the back injury which had temporarily forced him into retirement meant he wasn't the same performer he had once been anymore, but still, Kurt Henning at 70% was better than most wrestlers at 100. Sadly though, despite getting to have a singles match with Steve Austin on an episode of Raw soon thereafter, things would never really get out of second gear for Mr. Perfect this time around. Perhaps this was because Vince McMahon thought he was too old. Perhaps it was because he thought that, with his existing injury, it was too risky to push him any harder. Whatever the reason, as the weeks went on, Hennig would slip further and further down the card, with him ultimately being released from the company altogether following his involvement in the infamous plane ride from hell, where he and Brock Lesnar got into a brawl mid-fight and almost burst open the emergency door at 30,000 feet. Still, even if that was his swan song to WWE, it's a hell of a way to go out, and a story which will live on forever. And in the end, like everyone else on this list, it's ultimately the original run for Mr. Perfect which fans will remember most fondly. Sure, it's always nice to see someone make a return after years of having been away, whether it's for a nice nostalgia pop or to just prove that they still have some gas left in the tank. But as we've shown you today, sometimes it's better to leave the past in the past, especially if you're Shawn Michaels. Well guys, what did you think of the video? Let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, as well as follow Wrestle with Andy on Instagram and Twitter. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.